BC, how are we? Thanks for tuning in again. Um, so this video is going to be a review of the albums I got from the from the ad I answered. Okay, so that was a couple of videos ago. If you want to check that out, check it out. Otherwise, I'll show pretty much what I got from that ad response. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. By the way, cheers. Cup of coffee. Um, recently went past 200 subscribers, so thank you so much. Really, 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 really appreciate the interactions, the love, learning about new music, and just even delving deeper into the music I had before. And yeah, and just making videos is fun. So really, really appreciate it. You know, I think I think I've been around a year and a few months. Um, you know, um, well, I think my first video, one of my first videos, I said I'm very happy to get one sub. Very happy. Probably lied about that. But so stoked. 200 is a great number for me. Really happy. And, you know, it's, whatever. It's just love the interactions and, you know, this great community, you know. Um, so, anyway. So, thank you again. Contest. Maybe I got some ideas. Haven't done one yet. <sighs> got a great idea for a drawing. Just got to get a bit of an idea for a contest. We'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. So I got 22 albums from this collection. So answered the ad. Went to this guy's house. All his records were in his garage. But these are wall to wall, full of records. Um, you know, a lot of you commented like a candy, it's like a candy store in there, you could have been there for hours. I only had about a two hour period, which is pretty reasonable, but, um, you know, it was an interesting collection. It was, um, it was, um, oh, it wasn't like, you know, a big collection of Beatles and Stones and um, Zeppelin, sort of classic sort of stuff. Maybe you had them somewhere else, I don't know. He struck me as a um, a guy who just collector of things, antiques and collector of objects. Uh, you know, he was clearly a music lover because we talked about music, but you know, the way that he said that a lot of these are unplayed, like it's, it's a strange thing. I try to understand from him why they're unplayed, like <laughs> Why would they be in play, you know? Uh, to me, that says that he's just collecting them just to have them there as objects rather than, you know, and this stuff is meant to be played, you know? So, yeah. Um, so it was sort of quite an unusual collection. Um, there was a lot of stuff there. There is a lot of stuff there that is pretty mediocre. Um, out of all those records, you know, I got 22 the first time, I've been back again and got another 10. I don't know if there's much more else I want out of there. I haven't been through his 45s yet. Anyway, so, yeah, now this all happened over a month ago. I went through a period of not buying any albums for a month, which, you know, I had a big engorgement with these, so, you know, I had to digest them. Um, yeah, so that, that felt good, not buying any. And actually went to a record store and walked out empty-handed, which took a bit of willpower. But you know, it was anything I wanted was just sort of thirty dollars plus, and I just didn't want to pay that. You know. So anyway, okay. So I'm going to try and do some, show you what I got, oh, and that, you, yeah, and sort of just do a couple of needle drops. So out of the twenty-two. Two of them were 12 inch singles, they were New Order, Blue Monday, and Lenny Kravitz. Um, what was it? Uh, one of his songs, anyway. You all know that, anyway, so I don't need to show those. Um, out of the 20 I got here, two I didn't like, one I'm gonna, I want to sell, and the rest I like or love. Like to love, <laughs> somewhere between there. Okay, so, two I didn't like was this guitar, Mr. Guitar. I think I got a little bit rushed when I grabbed this, looked a little bit psychedelic guitar. Look pretty cool, Japanese sort of name there. Sound tick tick tick, but it's just sort of a bit of Latin guitar instrumentals. Nothing really that I like. It's okay, but you know. Um, 
This one, the other one I didn't like was this. The De La Nocte Paul Abdurjabara. It's sort of like a, a musical screen sort of thing. I didn't like it. They're going to go for trade. Um, the one I'm going to probably sell is uh, this one, Gas. Beautiful condition. Like This is unplayed. A lot of these are in very good condition. There's a couple that are scratched though. So you did play some, obviously. Or, well, we might have bought the question. I don't know. Anyway, um, so this gas, sort of, um, it's a 1990. They only had one album, the Australian band, sort of a hip hop rock. And so the instruments aren't bad. The sound isn't, sounds okay. Just something's missing out of it. And I think it's the vocals. And, um, or maybe it's the, you know, you don't spell gas like that, do you? You spell gas G A double S. That's what it is, isn't it, Bobby? So maybe that's what it's missing. It's missing an S. S. So anyway, that's going to go for it to sale. Um, so, so these are going loosely sort of based on from least favourite to most favourite. But I like to love, let's say. <laughs> um, okay. So Mondo Rock, Australian pop rock, pub rock band uh, in the 80s. Not their best album, in my opinion. Um, I love Chemistry, an album called Chemistry. I think this is their fourth album, but it's fronted by a guy called Ross Wilson. Uh, Ross, so it's gonna, he's a nice. He don't mean any bad Rosses, um, you know. Um, so, look, it's all right. Not the strongest one, but I'm happy to have it. I've got a few Mono Rocks, and they're just a, an important Australian band. He he fronted Daddy Cool, so big in the sort of 70s. They did that song um, Eagle Rock. Do where eagle rock. You probably know that. Well, now you do. <laughs> um, anyway, not bad, not bad. Um, Triple M. So this is a commercial station I listen to, a radio station. Pretty much just classic rock, really. So, um, you know, so I love it for that. I like it for that. You know, my hometown where I grew up, Shitney. You know, a lot of these artists, are pretty much, there's not much information at all about them, so I really got to dig deep into the annals to learn some stuff. So that's good, so it's just sort of learning a bit more about artists that maybe I didn't realize I listened to back in the day. Okay, so, okay, so, the tokens, the doo-wops. Um, I did write some stuff down, what did I write? So, this came out, um, so I have listened to all these several times. Um, what did I write about the tokens? Um, anyway, so it's do what? It basically, it's covers and mega mixes of covers. They actually wrote the uh, Lion Sleeps Tonight, a song that maybe a lot of us, our first song that we ever really learned about. Well, I don't know, I learned it, sort of got memories of it, sort of in the, maybe when I was like 10, 11, listened to that thing and cool. What did I write? So it's sort of a merger of sound, 80s sound. This came out in 80, 88, actually. They've been around 50s and 60s. Um, so sort of 80 sound with that sort of 50s, 60s blues rhythm-y, and put it as a mega mix sort of thing. So you heard probably, this is actually playing in the background there. So yeah, not bad, not bad. All right, so, um, Dave Warner's, actually probably, yeah, actually let's show you this one first. Stones, it's a Stones album, like, you know, Dirty Work, clearly it's no, it's not a great album, but it's still the Stones, and I'm gonna keep it. It's got, you know, um, Harlem Shuffle, great song, One Hit to the Body, great song, the rest is okay. Yeah, you know, terrible cover, not a great album, what year was it, 80 something, oh, what did I write here? 86, so, um, yep, I think I read somewhere, I wrote somewhere where it said, uh, worst fears of the baby boomers, because if the stones, if the stones sound this old and tired, what does it say about the original fans? <laughs> I don't know, it's, you know, anyway, we know it, so it's not the greatest, but it's still the stones, so it's going to stay. Let's go, actually, yeah, we'll say, so Dave Warner from the suburbs. Interesting guy. Uh, I didn't actually know this guy. 
uh, Australian guy. Um, he is a. This is a, like a par arc, a pub rock, punk sort of rock. So it's punk, punk pub rock sort of mix. Um, he initially. He sort of said in the 70s, early 70s, there was a band called Puss and said he's one of their first Australian punk rockers, which in the early 70s would have been a global early punk rocker then, I guess. But um, so I'm not sure I would take that one. But, you know, he's he's written some um, TV series and he's written some books. Um, this is a live album from a place called Bombay Rock, which... Um, 1978, which was a sort of famous venue in Melbourne, like a barn sort of music venue, um, known for, you know, nightly fights and raucous, raucous behaviour, but you know, classic stuff, great stuff. <laughs> um, you know, big Aussie bands like In Excess and Angels and Chisels and Church and Nick Cave played at this venue, including like in Nashville, like I read um, Steppenwolf and Eric Burden and uh, who else played there? Bo Diddley and yeah, someone else. Lots of people. Anyway, so pub rock sort of stuff, very Australian sort of feel about it. Um, look at those lyrics. I mean, the song titles Kangaroo Hop. The, uh, I can't read them backwards, but you can probably hopefully see them there. So interesting. So I'm going to put on a needle drop on this. Okay, it will take you off. And I'm going to just pause you for a sec. So I'll just play you Kangaroo Hop. Let's just go with that. Name drops a lot of Australian iconic, uh, iconic Australian people, objects, mentality. Anyway. Just bring you forward a little bit. Just bring you. So he sings. Come, come on, Dave. Rocky sort of sound. So, not bad. He's an interesting character. He had about five or six albums. Okay, so yeah. So that's Dave Warner. Okay, uh, next one. Super Jones. This is an interesting one. So um... I think a lot of them are anyway. So this is a Dutch band. It came out in 1980. Um, sort of a cross between Eagles meet ELO. Or even sound a bit like an Australian version, like a Dutch version of Australia's Cold Chisel. And he had one album. I like the cover, so I'm going to put on something for you. Let me pause you. Okay, let's put this one. This one's called Welcome. Welcome. This was a bit pop rock sort of thing. Um, a bit ahead of their time. Had an album called CDS. Computer dating service. I think the first dating service. Anyway, pretty cool. I liked it. So, um, next we're going to go with Cheat Trick. I mean, this is a classic, classic band, you know. In the 70s and then the 80s, got a bit more probably pop. Some hard sort of you know rock to it as well. Um, so what did I write about this? Um, yeah, they sort of went from that 
more 70s power pop to the more hard pop in um, in the 80s. This came in 82. Their sixth album, actually. Actually, I read somewhere that they referred to in Japan as the US Beatles, so interesting. Anyway, we all know Cheap Trick. Um, some great songs on there. Um, so, yeah, happy with that one. All right, Tom Petty. Um, this is one that's actually a bit scratched. On side two, the scratches and uh, the first two songs, it's pretty much unplayable, so it's a shame. But, you know, this is just a solid Tom Petty album. This came out... Uh... Mm -mm -mm. Oh, I can probably just look on here. 82. You know, it's probably not hugely standout tracks, but just a solid Tom Petty. You, know, you don't find much Tom Petty around here. I'd love to get in the great wide open and um, Fever Moon something, Fever Moon Fever something. Anyway, but Tom Petty, a solid album. It's a shame about the scratches. Probably that's the only one that's scratched up. The rest are pretty in at least VG++. Okay, so now getting a bit more into the gr the heavier, greater stuff. Not heavy, just the my more light stuff. Barbarous. So this is something. Um, actually, Steve Carlson just showed. He showed obviously a different album. There was a great cover as well. They love their sort of facial um, head sort of shots on the covers and. Amazing, look at that, they're inside his brain there. And this is cool. So, what did I write about Barbarous? Barbarous, I think that's how you say it. Um, so basically, this came out in 74. This is a DJ promo copy, which I like this, how it says, suggested cuts for play, and then the webbers that didn't like any of their suggestions there. Um, just a great, look at that, it's a great cover. Um, so let me just show you the record. Um, at Co. Um, yeah. So, what am I going to say about these guys? So, they were a Spanish band, but actually, as Steve said, they're actually quite international. Where they had like Filipino members, Portuguese members, Spanish. The main guy, um, who was, uh, what was his name? Fernando Ar Arbex, who, after this, after the first or second album, sort of became more a producer rather than an actual player. Um, 74 press um yeah initially they were more a funk rock band and then they sort of went on to this album a bit later in the career um do a bit more disco so i'm gonna put on um jack number one i mean hijack was number one song in spain in 74 so that's pretty cool and i'm gonna put, I'm gonna put on Susie wong for you okay just hold the bus Susie wong a funky disco sort of stuff. Really cool. <laughs> Very happy with that. Keep that running. Very cool stuff, eh? Alright, so next one we've got. Uh, Sons of Thunder. So this is one that just sort of screamed, come and grab me. Um, in the end, it's actually gospel, folky, sort of, uh, what did I write? Um... It's sort of folk, gospel, garagey sort of sound. So it's pretty cool. Come out in '69. So you know, in that time, psych was massive, wasn't it? And you had like you know folk stuff like Dylan and stuff like that. So this was something a bit different for the crew, for people. So that gospel. I think the gospel music was quite big then, but no expert at all. They could be just rubbish. That statement was made, but. 
on this um, Zondervan, Zondervan Recordings, which actually was a Bible um, publisher and also a Christian record label. So I'm going to put on um, a song for you. I'll come back to you. Those who wait on the Lord. Instruments, nice, cool vocals. Another one, so that was sort of uh, gospel, religious, is this Ted Ted Smith. Now, I think he was a Canadian pianist um, that was in, you know, influential in this sort of gospel genre. Um, when did this come out? What did I write about Ted? It's around 71, um, and it's basically asking... I think it was for like a stage, even like a high school stage musical sort of production. Ask questions. They're trying to ask what is what's life about. It does actually start with um, you born like with a baby crying, and it does revolution. Maybe at the end talks about death. So the revolution of life, evolution, well, whatever, whatever you know. But um, it starts with you born, you live, you die. So, it's true, I guess. <laughs> um, Actually makes it on the Bizarre Records website, so it's not bad. He actually, Ted Smith, actually commented on the Sons of Thunder. I don't know if you see that down there. Where is it? Sorry, oh, over here. So yeah, he liked the Sons of Thunder. So a little bit related here, sort of interesting. So I'm going to play some of this, am I? I probably will. Okay, this is Love and Understanding. Sort of a bit folky, a little bit of psyche, poppy, yeah, new vibrations. Oh, it's pretty nice, I like it. A quest in folk rock. Okay, moving on, this is getting long this video, sorry about that people. Maybe go have a break and come back to me. <laughs> um, next one. Garcia. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously from the Grateful Dead, which I didn't realise that. Um, because I've only got one Grateful Dead album, I think, The Working Man Dog, which I dig. I just never found any, so I don't know a lot about them. This is a repress, German repress on the lovely white wax. This is just folk, folky rock, I guess. Um, it, um, it's his second solo album. Um, or it does, it's a lot of covers actually. Um, so, sort of folky, it's sort of folky blues, alright? Yeah, so folky blues. Um, and I'll play you some on this one. That's what love will make you do. It's nice. I do hope to pick up some more Grateful Dead. Because, yeah, I like it. I mean, this is nice. Beautiful condition. Alrighty, what have we got next? 
The Talking Heads. This is the eighth and final album, Naked. Uh, great cover. This is a bit more. It's funky. It's a funky sort of uh, Talking Heads. Now I don't have. I've only got one or two Talking Heads, so I'm not sure. It's vastly different from a lot of stuff. Probably. Um, Stop Making Sense is one of my favourite, and uh, Remain in the Light. This is different, though. this is definitely more funky than that. Uh, what did I write about this? Yeah, funky reggae sort of feel, so... I won't put in this on because this video is getting too long, but I want to show you, it's on a limited edition Red Wax. So that's pretty cool. Look at that, nice. Very nice. This is nice. Alrighty, alright, I don't want to know. Okay, anyway. Alright, Buddy Holly, great. You know, don't have to put him on, everyone knows this. This is actually a uh, reissue on the MFP um, of the debut, uh, Chirping, I think Chirping Crickets album. Some classic songs in there, just great rockabilly, Buddy Holly. Alrighty, next one. This one is. One of the finds of the uh, of the this stack, Vertical Hold. Now, what did I write about them? They're Australian Adelaide band. In the 80s, they only had, I think, one album. Let me just check that. I don't want to be lying to you. Um, where did I write them? Now, I know Steve Carlson, he, he mentioned he's writing terrible. Mine is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible writing. <laughs> Um, 83, one album, previously known as the Gladiator Tortoise. Ah, these are sort of new wave pop ska. Really cool. Side one is awesome. Um, love this. They just didn't, they actually sent in their album to the radio station who played it and that's how they got some um, publicity. And that, that doesn't happen anymore, does it? It's a shame. Um, look, and after... They had a few other singles that didn't chart well and they broke up. But um, they've got a bit of a classical feel too because they've got a double bass player in there. Um, I can't remember what her name is, but yeah, I'll put some of this on for you. Okay, here we go. She said... Really love this album. Bit of a creepy cover. Sorry this video is too long, you can watch it over a long period, or just double tap. I really dig this album, this is really cool. Okay, coming up to the last two, which one's going to be... Alright, let's just go with it. Okay, classic, classic church starfish. Um, look, everyone knows this, well, I'm pretty sure everyone knows this. Absolute classic, classic album. You know, we all know one of Grandma's favourite bands, Where Will It Feature in 100? Sorry for spoil up. Who knows? Will it be there? <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, look, I never actually owned any church albums growing up. I was pretty content just hearing what I heard on the radio. So I was really intrigued to see what I thought. First time I listened to it, I thought, mm, 8 out of 10. Second time, 9 out of 10. I listened to another, say, 5 times. I'm going to stay about 9.5 out of 10. That classic indie rock. It sort of turned a little bit psychedelic rock, but I don't hear that at all. Got some great songs on there. All great songs, except one song, Spark, I don't really like very much. That's why I'm giving it nine and a half out of ten. I love it. I hope I don't get any hate for that, but it's a great album. It's very dreamy and atmospheric. It just takes you there. The sound takes you there. Probably my favourite song. It's lots of great songs. Probably my favourite is Reptile. Love it. You know, I do feel Coldplay took some influence from Church. I'm not sure if that's a fish. Yeah, you know, it did happen, but you can sell how, see how Coldplay did have some influence from them. And they've got two songs by the same title, Lost and Spark, are also Coldplay songs, so interesting. 
Okay, and maybe my favourite, on par with that, maybe just touches, just edges it out, the Skeptics. Um, just really amazing find, a flying nun. Um, this came out, oh, I'll tell you in a minute, let me show you the label. You do, you know, that, that sort of independent um, flying nun New Zealand sound label where, you know, it was sort of indie, jangly music and they sort of had a similar sound a lot of the bands on this label this skeptics though this is experimental um noise it's very different from anything else i've got in my collection so really happy interesting stuff what did i write about it um this is their third album it's called number three so it's gonna half an hour Skeptics 3, so yeah, came out in 87, they were a little bit of an outcast, what I got a vibe of, because, you know, it didn't have that sort of indie jangly sort of noise, not noise, um, sound, um, yeah, so I'll put a needle drop on this, probably the most famous song, or infamous you might say, is AFCO, it's basically, it highlights the the sheep industry, the meat sort of sheep industry in New Zealand, which, you know, was a big um, income for that country. Um, but they sort of, their video was basically, they showed sheep in the fields and they showed them being slaughtered and um, being bagged up with blood. Even the lead singer, who did pass away, uh, David, somebody's called, um, he was like put in a bag with sort of blood. Um, it's their third album, as I say, just great industrial noise. So I'm gonna put some on and that'll be the last drop. Okay, so this is AFCO. favourite song is uh, Turnover. I might release some songs from this in the future just so you get a bit of a feel, but Skeptics, maybe not everyone's cup of tea, but really dig it, really interesting. Sorry, very long video. Watch as little or all of it if you want. But anyway, take care. That is my review of that answered ad I put out. Oh, so...